Hello fellow introverts and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to do something that's a little close to home. We're talking about Lake Erie. You know, as most of my subscribers know, we live along Lake Erie, which is one of the five main Great Lakes, and it's had a uh, interesting and storied past. We'll get into that in some other video, but for now, we're going to talk about the captivating gem nestled in the heart of North America, as it holds a unique blend of natural beauty and historical significance. For centuries, Lake Erie has been a vital lifeline for indigenous communities and European settlers alike, serving as a vital route for trade and transportation. Spanning the area over nine 1,900 square miles, Lake Erie is the shallowest and the warmest of the Great Lakes, making it a crucial ecosystem teeming with diverse plants and animal life. The lake's rich biodiversity includes species of walleye, perch, and bass, attracting anglers from all across the continent. Its fertile waters provide sustenance for both wildlife and humans alike. However, Lake Erie's prosperity has come at a cost. Urbanization, agricultural runoff, and industrialization has led to environmental challenges, most notably the occurrence of harmful algae blooms, which is what we're going through right now. These algae blooms, fueled by excess nutrients like phosphorus, can create toxins harmful to aquatic life and human health. The most infamous instance occurred in the 1960s when pollution led to the lake being declared dead. But through coordinated efforts, the lake's health has significantly improved. You know, being a local, we take the lake for granted as it's always there it's always going to be there and it doesn't really matter what happens to it but here are a few unique creatures to call lake erie home first up is the freshwater drum fish physical characteristics the freshwater drum has a unique appearance they have a deep laterally compressed body with high arched back their coloration varies silvery to brass and they often have dark vertical bars or blotches on their sides. They possess a dorsal fin with spines and soft rays, as well as an anal fin with a long base. These fish, adults can uh, reach for about 12 to 24 inches in length, and some have been known to exceed 30 inches. They can weigh up to 15 pounds or more, which is pretty, pretty healthy little fish. Drumfish are opportunistic feeders and consume varied diet. The menu includes insects, small fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. Their specialized throat muscle, which produces a distinctive grunting sound, can help them crush shells and other prey. Freshwater drum have a relatively long lifespan, often reaching 10 to 15 years. As they grow, their diet shifts from primarily zooplankton to large prey items. Next, we have freshwater jellyfish. Freshwater jellyfish belong to the phylum Cyndaria and the class of Hydrozoa, which includes other jellyfish species found in marine environments. Unlike their marine counterparts, freshwater jellyfish inhabit lakes, ponds, reservoirs, and slow-moving rivers in various parts of the world. They prefer calm, freshwater bodies with suitable conditions for their survival. Freshwater jellyfish undergo a complex life cycle involving both a polyp stage and a medusa jellyfish-like stage. The polyp stage attaches to a submerged object like aquatic plants or rocks, and they're typically inconspicuous and can reproduce asexually by budding. The medusa stage is a more recognizable form of the freshwater jellyfish. They have a translucent, bell-shaped body with delicate tentacles that contain specialized cells called syndocytes. These cells house nemocysts, which are used for defense and capturing prey. Freshwater jellyfish primarily feed on microscopic organisms like zooplankton and small aquatic invertebrates. They use their tentacles to immobilize prey before consuming it. Now, before you go get in your jellyfish nets, you gotta realize that these freshwater jellyfish are relatively small compared to saltwater jellyfish. These are typically anywhere from 0.2 to 2 inches, and that's all you're gonna get, man. Now, again, jellyfish do sting, right? But this little guy, he's not really big enough uh, to do anything more than cause a mild irritation. He's a lot less invasive than your neighbor's kids, I'll tell you that much. Next up is a freshwater sponge, like SpongeBob. Freshwater sponges have a simple body structure consisting of a porous and perforated outer later called a dermis, which encloses a central cavity called the atrium. The dermis contains numerous pores and channels through which water flows and some brown square pants with some socks with a red and blue stripe. Water is drawn into the sponge through the pores by the beating of the specialized cells called the chaosates, which line the inner surface of the atrium. They have whip-like appendages called flagella that create currents, 
allowing them to filter out microscopic food particles, such as bacteria and plankton. The filter water exits the sponge through large openings called oscula. Freshwater sponges reproduce both sexually and asexually. Asexual reproducing often involves the production of gemmules, which are tough, dormant capsules containing a group of cells that can survive harsh conditions. Freshwater sponges can be found in a variety of freshwater environments, including lakes, ponds, slow moving rivers, and even some damp terrestrial habitats, or in a pineapple under the sea. They can be various sizes, shapes, and colors. Some of them are more matte-like. Other forms are more tubular or even branching into like a fractal pattern. Next, we're going back to the fish. It is called a gizzard shad. The gizzard shad have a somewhat elongated and laterally compressed body. They are typically silver in color with a dark spot at the base of their tail fin. The scales are thin and cycloid, giving them a smooth appearance. They are commonly found in wide range in the freshwater environments. They often inhabit in open water areas and are known for their schooling behavior. These fish are primarily filter feeders. They possess a specialized feeding apparatus including gill rakes, which allows them to filter plankton and other small organisms in the water. Their efficient feeders use their gills to strain food particles as water passes through. Gizzard shad are named for the muscular gizzard, a part of the digestive system. This gizzard is capable of grinding and breaking down tough plant materials, allowing them to process wide range of food sources. Now, they don't live as long as everything else. They only live for a few years um, and they're known for the rapid growth rates during the early stages of life. Next is the Erie Lake Sturgeon. Lake Sturgeon are characterized by their elongated torpedo-shaped body and cartilaginous skeleton. They can grow to impressive sizes with lengths exceeding 6 feet 2 meters and can weigh over 150 pounds 68 kilometers. Their coloration varies from light to dark often with mottled appearance. Lake Erie Sturgeon are found in various freshwater habitats including the Great Lakes and their connecting rivers. Lake Erie serves as an important spawning and nursery ground for these fish. Sturgeon are known for their remarkable longevity. They have one of the longest lifespans of, of any species of fish, often living over a hundred years old. Now, don't worry, these monsters of the deep are bottom feeders. They use their sensitive barbels to locate food. Their diet primarily consists of aquatic invertebrates, small fish, and plant materials. Now, they have a unique behavior, such as breaching the water surface and leaping into the air. This behavior may serve several purposes, including communication, feeding, and clearing parasites. Now, unfortunately, the population has declined significantly due to overfishing, habitat loss, pollution, and the construction of dams to block their migration routes. As a result, many populations populations are now listed threatened or endangered. Next is the possum shrimp. Possum shrimp, also known as the mycid shrimp or freshwater shrimp, refers to various species of other mycid order. These small shrimp-like crustaceans inhabit a variety of aquatic environments, including freshwater and marine habitats. Uh, they have a segmented body with a well-developed carapace covering their thorax. As we know, shrimp are water bugs, but they're delicious. So, they have a pair of stocked eyes and a prominent tail fin, which they use for swimming. Their size can vary, but they are generally small, ranging from a few millimeters to about a half an inch in length. The shrimp are incredibly adaptable and can be found in both freshwater and marine environments. In freshwater, they inhabit lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams. They often prefer slow moving and still waters with adequate vegetation. Next is the round goby. It is a small invasive fish species that can rapidly spread across various freshwater and brackish water habitats. The round goby has a distinctive appearance with a stocky round body and a flattened head. It is characterized by a fused pelvic fin that forms a suction cup. The coloration of the round goby can vary but often includes mottled patterns ranging from gray to brown to green. Originally from the Black and the Caspian Sea regions, the round goby was introduced in the Great Lakes in North America and other bodies of water around the world through ballast water from ships. It thrives in a range of habitats including rocky and sandy bottoms, shorelines, piers, and areas with human infrastructure. Now, the problem with these guys is they are invasive to Lake Erie. They are aggressive and territorial and they compete with the native fish for resources sometimes out competing with them for food and spawning sites. Due to their invasive nature, efforts have been made to manage and control round goby populations. These efforts include implementing regulations to prevent further introductions, studying their behavior and ecology to develop effective management strategies and promoting public awareness. Um, so I'm pretty sure I'd have to check on that. Don't take my word as gospel, but I'm pretty sure if you catch some of these at a lake, you're supposed to disregard them and not place them back in. Next 
is a sea lamprey. Now, you've seen these things. They're, they're the thing of nightmares. It's a parasitic fish species. A sea lamprey has a unique and distinctive appearance. They have an elongated eel-like body with a circular tooth-filled mouth that they use to attach to their host fish. They have like a million and thirty teeth and they're disgusting. Their coloration varies, typically ranging from brown to gray to their upper body and lighter on their underside. They have a complex life cycle that involves both parasitic and non-parasitic stages. After hatching from the egg laid in gravel nests, they spend several years as filter feeding larvae, burrowed in sediment. During this stage, they filter organic matter from the water. Once they reach a certain size, sea lampreys transform into the parasitic phrase, during which they migrate to open water, using their suction cup-like mouth to attach to the sides of host fish. They rasp through the host fish flesh with their specialized tongue and feed on blood and bodily fluids. This parasitic feeding can severely weaken or even kill host fish. Adult lampreys return to their natal streams to spawn. They build nests using their bodies to create depressions in the gravel. Females lay eggs in their nest and the males release sperm. After fertilization, adults die, completing their life cycle. Now, again, these are not native to the Great Lakes ecosystem. They entered the Great Lakes through artificial canals and have had a profound effect on native fish populations. The parasitic feeding of sea lampreys has contributed to the decline of fish species like lake trout and white fish. Next, the spotted gar. Spotted gar have a long, slender body with an elongated, tooth-filled snout and a distinct pattern of spots on their body which gives them their name. They have a bony, armor-like exterior composed of gonoid scales which are hard and diamond shaped, providing protection. Spotted gar are primarily found in slow moving or still freshwater habitats. They like the shallow and the vegetated environments. Spotted gar are carnivorous predators, and they have a unique feeding behavior where they wait motionless in the water and ambush their prey, using their sharp teeth to capture fish and other aquatic organisms. Spotted gar are facultative air breathers, which means they can also obtain oxygen through the air. They have a modified swim bladder that functions as a lung, allowing them to gulp air from the water surface if oxygen levels are low. Now, garfish are often referred to as living fossils due to their primitive characteristics and resemblance to their prehistoric ancestors. They have been around for millions of years and offer insight into the evolutionary history of fish. And with that, guys, that is a little taste of home. If you get a chance to get out, go visit the peninsula. It's not that bad. And with that, I will see you nerds later.